Have you ever wondered how memory experts can instantly remember long digits and numbers, but you're still struggling to learn everything you need for that exam? Well, in today's video, I'm going to cover how we can hack how we learn and remember things for longer by understanding just how our memory works. Hey folks, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name's Alex. I'm a surgeon and the founder of a few edtech companies. And on this channel, we focus on learning and human performance to help you live healthier, wealthier, happier, and more productive lives. Now, when we're studying for exams, it's stressful as we're being asked to understand and remember key concepts, which we then need to be able to apply to score top grades and advance in our education, work, and generally in life. Exams are set by schools, universities, and any education system as a way to gauge knowledge and set standards by assessing you practice under test conditions. But due to their impact on your life, they often feel much more scary than they do helpful. In technical terms, studying is about taking information and packaging it in our memory, and practicing is about our ability to retrieve or recall that information and apply it when it matters. If we can encode, store, and retrieve information on demand, we can consider that information has been learned. But how do these concepts fit together? And how do we use them to learn effectively? And just what the heck is the best way to learn something, encoding or active recall? Well, I'm gonna explain all of this by breaking this video up so that we understand how our brain filters and stores memories. I'm gonna tell you about the three stages in the process of learning and remembering, specifically encoding, storage and retrieval, and then I'll look at practical strategies that combine encoding and retrieval to help you learn faster. And finally, if you're a fan of Loki, stick around as at the end of the video, I'm gonna cover why the classic mnemonic device, the method of Loki works so well and how it's used by memory masters. So do hit subscribe if you're keen to get more learning and performance hacks direct to your brain each week. And let's get into things, starting off with a quick, but quite uninteresting fact. So did you know that the first phone numbers were limited to seven digits, as psychologists determined that most errors occurred when the number was increased to eight digits or higher, which cost the phone companies money? Well, for most of us, remembering digits relies on short-term memory or working memory, the ability to hold information in our minds for a brief time and work with it. For example, multiplying 24 by 17 without using paper would rely on your short-term or working memory. Another type of memory is episodic memory. This is the ability to remember the episodes of our lives. If you were given the task of recalling everything you did two days ago, that would be a test of your episodic memory. You'd be required to mentally travel through the day in your mind and note down its main events. Memory masters and champions like Guinness World Record holder Simon Reinhardt, on the other hand, can remember upwards of 90 digits by simply looking at a series of cards, and we'll look at some strategies to do just that later on in the video. The concept of memory storage was analyzed by American psychologists, including George Miller, in the 1950s. They developed something called information processing theory, which is a cognitive theory that focuses on how information is processed into our brains. The theory describes how our brains filter information from what we're paying attention to in the present moment, to what gets stored in our short-term memory or working memory, and ultimately what gets moved into our long-term memory. The premise of information processing theory is that creating a long-term memory is something that happens in stages. First, we perceive something through our sensory memory, which is everything we can see, hear, feel or taste in a given moment. Our short-term memory is what we then use to remember things for short periods, like a phone number. And long-term memory is stored permanently in our brains, which episodic memory is a category of. Information processing theory essentially compares the human brain to a computer. The input is the information we give to the computer, while the CPU is likened to our short-term memory and the hard drive is our long-term memory. Our cognitive processes filter information, deciding what is important enough to save from our sensory memory to our short-term memory and ultimately to encode into our long-term memory. Our cognitive processes include thinking, perception, remembering, recognition, logical reasoning, imagining, problem solving, and our sense of judgment and planning. Information is filtered from our sensory memory into our short-term or working memory. From here, we process the information further. Some of the information we hold in our short-term memory is discarded or filtered away once again, and a portion of it is encoded or stored in our long-term memory. A number of factors impact how we process things in our working memory. These include our individual cognitive abilities, the amount of information we're being asked to remember at any given time, how focused we're able to be on a given day, and how much of our attention we're giving to that information. As you can see from this diagram, our sensory and working memories have a limited capacity for storing information. The term cognitive load relates to the amount of information that working memory can hold at any time. Since working memory has a limited capacity, 
Learning methods should avoid overloading it with additional activities that don't directly contribute to learning. So anything from distractions to trying to learn too much without taking breaks and looking after yourself is going to be detrimental here. We also have the ability to focus on the information we deem to be the most relevant. We then use selective processing to bring our attention to those details in an effort to remember them for the future. Repetition is a crucial factor here. If we want to transfer crucial information from our short-term memory into long-term storage, we must repeat it more than once, and this is where active recall and spacing is so important. But as we know from my other videos in the learning series, just remembering facts isn't necessarily going to help you understand the topic or to effectively apply your knowledge. So let's look at how memory relates to learning. In 1963, psychologist Arthur Melton outlined three related stages necessary for learning in the memory process. Encoding, storage, and retrieval. Encoding is defined as the initial learning of information. Storage refers to maintaining information over time, and retrieval is the ability to access information when you need it. If you meet someone for the first time at a party or event, you need to encode their name while you associate that name with their face. Then you need to maintain the information over time. If you see that person a week later, you need to recognize their face and have it serve as a cue to retrieve their name. Any successful act of remembering requires that all three stages be intact. So let's look at encoding first. Encoding refers to the initial experience of perceiving and processing information so that it can be stored in the brain. Think of encoding kind of like how the brain puts information into a package before it's stored and the package is then sent and unwrapped when it's retrieved. Now our brains encode information all the time and as we've seen, our brains try and filter out any information that doesn't appear critical and we're selective about what we remember. As a quick example of this, you might take the same train or car journey or walk into work every single day but it probably isn't that memorable unless something unusual happens. Equally, events that are closely linked to a powerful sensory stimulus are more likely to be stored and remembered. For example, most people remember natural disasters or the birth of a child because they're anchored with strong emotional stimuli. In fact, in Jordan Belfort's book, The Wolf of Wall Street, one of his learning hacks for his sales team is to anchor the feeling of a successful sale into their memory using a powerful scent to help recall this feeling and their sales process ahead of their next sales call. Psychologists have studied many encoding strategies that can be used during study to improve retention. First, research by Craig and Lockhart in 1972 advised that as we study, we should think of the meaning of the events we're learning and we should try to relate new events to information we already know. This helps us form associations that we can use to retrieve information later on. This is also something outlined by Herman Ebinghaus in his suggestions on how to disrupt the forgetting curve. And this is why I talk about building context when applying active recall and why interleaving is so important to connect new content to your existing knowledge to aid recall. Secondly, visualizing information via memory devices like mnemonics also helps make events more memorable. Creating vivid images out of information can greatly improve later recall, as highlighted by Bauer and Reitman in 1972 in their paper on mnemonic usage in multi-list learning. Creating imagery is part of the technique Simon Reinhardt uses to remember huge numbers of digits, but even us non-memory masters can all use images to encode information more effectively. The basic concept behind good encoding strategies is to form distinctive memories, so ones that stand out since our brains filter things that don't stand out, and to form links or association among memories to help later retrieve them, as suggested by Hunter McDaniel in 1993. Encoding is the initial registration and packaging of information. It's essential in the learning and memory process. Unless an event is encoded, it will not be successfully remembered later. However, just because an event is encoded, even if it's encoded really well, there's no guarantee that it will be remembered later as there are two other key steps in how we learn things, storage and retrieval. Storage is all about how we store the package of information in our brains. When we encode a packet of information, a neurobiological change happens in our brains between neurons and synapses. These changes are termed engrams or memory traces by psychologists and neurobiologists. Memories have to be stored somewhere in the brain, so in order to do so, the brain biochemically alters itself and its neural tissue. Just like you might write yourself a note to remind you of something to do later, the brain writes a memory trace, changing its own physiological composition to do so. The basic idea is that events or occurrences in our environment create engrams through a process called consolidation. The neural changes that occur after learning to create the memory trace of an experience. 
Memory consolidation is the process by which a temporary short-term memory is transformed into a more stable long-term memory. So let's now look at the final step in learning, retrieval. Now I talk about active recall and retrieval as being a really important way to learn. And psychologist Endel Tolving argued that the key process in memory is retrieval. So why should retrieval be given more prominence than encoding or storage? Well, for one thing, if information were encoded and stored but could not be retrieved, it would be absolutely useless. We encode and store thousands of events, conversations, sites, things we learn every single day, creating memory traces. However, we later access only a tiny portion of what we've taken in. Most of our memories will never be used in the sense of being brought back to our mind consciously. This fact seems so obvious that we rarely reflect on it, but it's vital in the context of how we learn, as if we learn passively without testing ourselves, we'll simply forget anything we're looking at. Our memory storage can't really be impacted, but we can test ourselves and improve our ability to recall information. As we know from my other videos on active recall, the active process of retrieving memories from our brains strengthens connections and is a more efficient way to learn. So what factors determine how well information can be retrieved from our memory? Well, one critical factor is the type of hints or cues in the environment. When we encode or package up information, as we know if that information is distinctive, it will be easier for us to remember. Think of our packages of encoded memories in a warehouse, and only one is read, or in more practical terms, think about a scent evoking a memory without you even trying to think about it, just like Jordan Belfort tried with his sales team. To improve learning and memory, we need to encode information in conjunction with strong cues that will bring back the remembered information when we need it. But how do we actually do this? Well, let's recall the two critical principles we've just discussed. To maximize retrieval, we should construct meaningful memory cues that are reminders of the original experience. And those cues should be distinctive and not associated with other memories. As Ebinghaus says, information should be relevant and well represented with mnemonics and memory cues. So how can this information be used practically to combine the memory cues of encoding and the self-testing and repetition of active recall and spacing? Well, the key here is how you integrate mnemonic devices. If we think back to memory masters and how they're able to learn huge lists of numbers and facts, they do it by making strong associations in their brain and ordering that information. Take, for example, the following list of numbers and items. By using rhyming words, numbers and orders and images, you can quickly learn which word is associated with a number. So if you check out this list, it would probably take you less than 10 minutes to learn this list and practice recalling it several times. Remember to use active recall when recalling mnemonics as this helps to store these principles deeply in your brain. This mnemonic device is called the PEG word technique, as you would then have a set of PEG words on which you can hang memories. So for example, if you then had to remember an unordered list of random items, like the points in a talk you're giving, you could connect the things you're trying to remember to this list by making visual cues. So for example, if the first bullet point in a speech you want to make is about your pet hamster, you might visualize this in your mind next to a bun to make it stand out and easy to remember as bun was the mnemonic device and visual aid for the number one in our list. The more absurd this is, the better. Equally, for things like medicine, when you're learning long lists of information, mnemonics like two zebras borrowed my car for the branches of the facial nerve are great ways to effectively encode and create retrieval cues as you learn. And you're using active recall to test yourself on this mnemonic to make sure you understand what it means and how to use it. So how does Simon Reinhardt remember all those digits? Well, essentially, he's using a much more complex system based on these same principles. In his case, he uses memory palaces or the method of Loki, which combine images with huge amounts of numbers. For example, he imagines walking through a mental mock-up of his house and distinct areas and objects. Simon has hundreds of such memory palaces that he uses. Next, for remembering digits, he's memorized a set of 10,000 images. Every four-digit number for him brings forth a mental image. So for example, 6187 might recall a picture of Michael Jackson. When Simon hears all the numbers coming at him, he places an image for every four digits into a location in his memory palace. He can do this at an incredibly rapid rate, faster than four digits for four seconds when they're flashed up visually. In addition to mnemonics, here are four quick ways to improve your ability to remember anything when learning. Firstly, break up things into smaller parts. There's only so much information we can take on board at once, our so-called cognitive load. So when you're learning, you should move at an appropriate pace, giving yourself plenty of breaks and opportunities to process that information. Make it meaningful. You're more likely to retain information that's meaningful by connecting it to real life scenarios and to your own personal experiences. So try and visualize and link concepts together as you test yourself. Connect the dots. 
To optimize the chances of material being retained in your long-term memory, you should interleave topics. By providing sufficient background information and connecting the current topic to what's previously been learned and to what will be learned next, it will help you to more easily remember things. And finally, repeat, repeat, repeat. One of the simplest ways to encode new facts into long-term memory is to present it more than once. Repeating information in different formats, whether verbal, written, visual, or otherwise, is a great way of doing this. You might notice I've been doing this lots with some key concepts, and I'm repeating it again here so that you retain it in the future. So to summarize, remembering things involves three related processes, encoding information, storing it, and then retrieving it. The key to improving our ability to remember is to improve the processes of encoding and to use techniques that guarantee effective retrieval of information. Good encoding techniques include relating new information to what we already know, forming mental images, and creating associations among information that needs to be remembered, so-called memory mnemonics. The key to good retrieval is developing effective cues that will lead you back to that encoded information, and some of the best cues are sensory and distinct, like a scent or a very strong feeling. Now, we've covered lots of concepts around learning and active recall, and I'm gonna pop up a link to our learning series in the end cards. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for being a subscriber to the channel. Do hit subscribe if you haven't already done so, and let me know in the comments below if you've got any topics you'd like to see covered, and I'll catch you again in the next video.